Uh, many thanks, uh, Carla. Thank you very much indeed. First of all, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and thank you, uh, Takeda and the uh, organizers for their kind invitation. Um, over the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about a very, very important uh, topic, and that is um, hereditary angioedema. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the prevention of attacks using uh, long term uh, prophylaxis. So um, the main objectives of, of my talk today was to increase the awareness of HAE, an uncommon and potentially fatal disease, and they, you know, for you to gain some expert knowledge on the uh, investigations and the available therapeutic options uh, that are currently being made uh, available to us. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to give you some basic concept about the disease. I'm going to talk about the diagnosis, treatment options, and, and introduced Taxiro or lanadilumab, which actually had uh, it's a game changer in, in the treatment of patients with HAE. And then I'm going to finish with uh, sharing with you a case that we've been looking after for some time at this point in time. So what is hereditary angioedema? Hereditary angioedema is a life-threatening um, disorder caused by um, C1 inhibitor deficiency. Um, it's an autosomal dominant uh, disease and it is characterized by recurrent episodes uh, of cutaneous and muc mucous membrane swelling. So this is the sort of, a, in a nutshell, what uh, hereditary angioedema is. Now, uh, the epidemiology, this is very interesting. This is, um, um, basically we don't have data regionally and I'm gonna talk about this on my next slide, but in general, the estimated prevalence of this condition is about one in 50,000. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's higher than that. I think it's higher than this because of the delays and misdiagnosis. So uh, really, um, it, you know, we don't really know uh, the, the prevalence of this condition. For example, in the States, there are about 8,000 individuals suffer from this condition. In Europe, about 15,000. Um, worldwide, there is about 200,000 patients. But I think um, because of the delayed diagnosis, because of the, you know, people are unaware of this uh, rare, um, I, sh I shouldn't be saying rare, it's actually an uncommon disease. Uh, the, the, the prevalence isn't really very accurate. So in our region, for example, uh, the MENA region, um, which includes about 22 countries, um, covering nearly 15 million square kilometers from Morocco to Iran, and we account for about 6% of the total world population, and the population, of course, a uh, mix of Arab, Persian, Turks, etc. That's, you know, that's what we have. We have about three to 400 patients with hereditary angioedema. That's what we know about, maximum 500. So if we look at the um, estimated prevalence of this condition of one in 50,000, we should have at least more than 4,000 patients in, in, with, with hereditary angioedema, uh, you know, uh, detected. And instead, we have only maximum of five, uh, 500. And there are, the reason for this is that because there are a lot of diagnostic challenges, um, mainly due to poor awareness of the disease, not only in the public, but also uh, in the healthcare professionals. So in venues like this, we try to increase the awareness. We do a lot of talks to uh, general practitioners, primary care physicians, etc., to really increase the, the awareness of, of this uh, really serious um, immunodeficiency, if you like. So there are three main types of HAE, type one. I'm not sure where the, where's the pointer. Sorry. Okay, so there, we have three types of, of uh, hereditary angioedema. So we have the commonest type, which is type one, which is due to the uh, low levels of plasma uh, C1 inhibitor. Now, although it is a deficiency, it's not really a total deficiency, you know, uh, about uh, the majority of patients would have about 30% of the protein level, but it is, it's not enough really. Uh, so it's not total, total deficiency, uh, but the, the levels are low. Uh, about 15 patients, sorry, about 15% of patients would have type two, and, and this is where patients have normal levels of C1 inhibitor, 
but it is dysfunctional. So you measure the silver uh, inhibitor, you find it either no, normal or slightly raised, but it's not really functional. And there is a rare type of HAE that accounts for about less than maybe uh, five to ten percent of patients, where um, patients have uh, HAE with normal uh, levels but, uh, of C1 inhibitor, and, and they are um, there are various uh, causes for this. But again, this type is rare. So our focus will be on the um, uh, on the type one and type two uh, HAE, if you like. Now, the pathophysiology of this disease, we have this C1 inhibitor, which is a really a, an enzyme that uh, it's, a, it's a key mediator uh, of inflammation, that it, it inhibits plasma um, calcine levels. And um, within the calcine uh, kinin pathway, when it is deficient or lack, uh, the, the, or the, the function is lacking, uh, the protein results in uncontrolled calcrine activity, leading to increased generation of as active uh, mediators, including bradykinin, and that leads to the swelling. Now, the um, C1 inhibitor also is very important in the, the uh, calculation pathway as well. What are the main triggers of HAE attacks? The common, the many, many attacks occur without any clear trigger. So patients develop uh, these swellings um, you know, without a specific trigger. However, there are three uh, common um, factors that are really important um, for triggering, triggering um, swellings in these patients. So minor trauma, emotional stress, and airway infection. These are the most identified uh, causes or triggers for um, HA attacks or swelling attacks uh, in these uh, patients. Now, the commonest, um, the, the, for two, for as I said, the, uh, I'm going to concentrate only on type 1 and type 2 um, HA here. The attacks are similar, the swellings are that you can't clinically differentiate between the two um, types. Uh, because they have identical uh, clinical characteristics. Uh, the angiodema attacks vary in location, frequency, and severity. Most common um, places would be uh, face, abdomen, urogenital area, and extremities. Um, laryngeal attacks, fatal, serious, but they are not very common. Um, about 50% of patients will have more than one laryngeal attack in their lifetime, so it's not very common. And in fact, in my clinical experience, I've looked after about 70 patients with HAE. Really, laryngeal attacks are not very common, but they do uh, occur, and, and they're really serious. Um, so this is just an example of uh, such attacks. So this is, uh, you know, this is, a, this, is, this is a patient with abdominal attacks. There's an abdominal distension, as you can see. This is the disfigurement of the face, patients really are, are troubled with their um, uh, swelling when it took, uh, attacks the, the, the face because that is the thing that you can see and they, it's really very embarrassing, embarrassing and actually cause a lot of anxiety uh, and, and stress to the patients of course. And then the peripheral attacks will, will most patients get and they tend to ignore. They, uh, when you talk to these patients about their swelling, say, yes, doctor, I get, uh, you know, peripheral swelling every, every now and then. I, I, they don't bother me. They last for a few days and, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay then after that. But they, they, the ones that are really serious are the ones that are attacks and the, the uh, facial attacks and, of course, the laryngeal attacks. Now, the clinical course of the swellings is really very important, and that differentiates um, these types of swelling from the, uh, from the um, allergic swelling, for example. Sim here, in HAE, symptoms typically worsen over the first 24 hours and subside over three days. So they start, it's a slowly developing process, so the patients will have the swelling, uh, you know, uh, here, for example, and it takes up to five days you know, it peaks around the third or the second or third day and it slowly regress. Now, even without treatment, uh, and I'm talking here about most of the attacks I'm talking about, the peripheral swelling in particular, where 
patients, uh, you know, they say, look, I, I don't bother even going to the emergency or, you know, I'll, I'll, let, let, I'll let it wait and disappear spontaneously. Um, and, and as I said, they may spread to other locations uh, uh, before resolving, but the key factor or the key feature of the of the swellings in HAE is that it's a slow uh, progressive swelling while the allergic swelling the swellings that you see in you know allergic disorders but for example they just you know quickly within 24 hours full-blown um, swelling of the face of other of the extremities and it, it will take time you know quickly uh, resolve as well and it will respond to antihistamines well here the swellings actually take longer than 24 hours, may take uh, a few days, as I said, before it resolves, and it doesn't respond to the antihistamines. So this is another key factor, actually. Now, as I said, the swelling in, in hereditary angioedema are different from other uh, angioedemas. Um, as I said, one of the key factors here is, is the longer uh, attack duration, up to five days, uh, absence of urticaria, there's no urticaria, usually there's swelling, there's soft tissue swelling, um, and failure, of course, as I said, to respond to antihistamines, steroids, epinephrine, and um, uh, family history. So the family history uh, is really very important. However, family history, if it's absent, does not exclude um, hereditary angioedema, of course. But if there is a family history of um, uh, angioedema, or that makes the diagnosis very, very um, easy, if you like. Now, as I have been saying all the time, the HA is frequently misdiagnosed due to the fact that it is a rare disease, and the symptoms overlap with other uh, more frequent conditions. So, for example, abdominal pain um, is common among patients with HAE, but also frequent. It's a frequent symptom uh, in the general population. So a lot of the patients, and as you'll see in the case I'm going to, I'm going to present later on, actually uh, they present to, to, with, with, with severe abdominal pain, but because abdominal pain is common, it is dismissed for HAE. Of course, um, misdiagnosis can result in, in MS3 treatment. So I had patients who had laparotomies, uh, but, you know, multiple uh, scans, multiple, you know, procedures. Uh, would these, in fact, increase the risk of death? Because as I said, trauma can actually trigger uh, attacks of angioedema. Now, um, misdiagnosis is more common if there is no family history. So family history will make the diagnosis very easy to write. Now, again and again, diagnostic delays are very common and um, you know, after, and this is, I've been published, you know, previously and you know, up to more than 10 years of delay in diagnosis. We have patients, have patients who've been the diagnosis delayed uh, for about seven or eight years. So again, because of the uh, reasons that I've mentioned earlier. Now, here we have a sort of a, um, you know, a, a simple way of diagnosing patients with HAE. So uh, the definitive diagnosis of uh, type one and type two requires the measurement of antigenic and functional uh, C1 inhibitor and C4. So for example, um, if, if, the, um, if a patient with, sorry, So for example, in, in time one uh, HAE, which forms the majority of the patients, the C4 levels is also, also uh, always low. C1 inhibitor antigenic level or the plasma level of, the, of C1 inhibitor is low and the function is low. The other, uh, for example, the type two, the, which forms about 15%, as I said earlier, C4 is low, um, the antigenic, uh, C1 inhibitor is either normal or slightly raised, but the function is low. The other rare type, you know, um, everything is normal. So C4, sometimes the, for example, the um, C1 inhibitor level or function are not available in, all, in most labs. So 
this is a good way. Measuring only C4 can usually, um, you know, hint that diagnosis if there is a history suggestive of HAE. Now, how do we treat um, and, and manage these patients? So the World Allergy Organization and the um, European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology have looked uh, and to this and, and have actually produced um, uh, guidelines throughout the years. The most recent one was published in uh, 2021. And the aim of these guidelines is to um, assist a clinician and their patients in making and addressing the uh, issue related to the um, to uh, HAE. Now, the current guidelines contains 28 recommendations, uh, eight more than the ones produced in 2017. And these current guidelines um, address five main questions. How should we, um, how should HAE one one and two types be defined and classified? How should these patients be diagnosed? Should these patients receive prophylactic uh, um, or in demand treatment? And what treatment options are available? Should these patients manage dire directly in especially uh, patient groups or uh, hospital setting? Uh, what do we do with pregnant lactating uh, women and children? Should um, HIA uh, patients um, incorporate, you know, self-administration of therapies and patient support uh, measures. So these are the, the five pillars, if you like, uh, that was put um, by the WOW and the IACI trying to address the management of HAE patients. What I'm going to do in the next uh, number of slides is go through uh, these uh, uh, points uh, briefly so you'd know what we are talking about. So uh, the guidelines for um, diagnosing these patients recommend that all patients suspected uh, to have uh, HAE are assessed for blood levels of C1 inhibitor function, C1 inhibitor protein levels, and C4. So the three main uh, components need to be uh, checked. Testing for C1 inhibitor function, protein, and C4 is repeated. We should repeat these tests to make sure that the patient has the correct diagnosis. And to, because, you know, once, um, you know, uh, in, in, is not really enough. So we have to really repeat um, uh, these, these tests, okay? Now we have to assess these patients and, you know, assess their, you know, if there is a family history and sort of symptoms, uh, recurrent and painful abdominal symptoms, occurrence of upper airway edema, uh, failure to respond uh, to antihistamine steroids and epinephrine, presence of prodromal signs and symptoms before the swellings, and absence of urticaria. So, patients that you know should be assessed based on these uh, parameters, and the uh, um, complement test should be performed. The three main complement uh, tests that are important here. Now the. Recommendation for patients with, um, uh, you know, um, type one and two, again, patients who are suspected to have HAE and have normal C1 inhibitor levels of function are assessed for known mutation un underlying uh, HAE C1 inhibitor. So we can, now we have the, the this is, and this is a new recommendation. So we actually can now send blood samples to check for the various genes that I've mentioned in earlier in earlier slides. Now, again, in terms of, of recommendation for on-demand treatment uh, for, for these patients, all attacks should be considered for on-demand treatment. So regardless of, of uh, whether it's type one, two, or three, they all should be considered for on-demand treatment. Any attack affecting or potentially affecting upper airway should be treated. There's no doubt about that. As, at, attacks should be treated as early as possible. And the HA attack should be treated either with icatabant, ICAT, which is a bradykinin uh, receptor antagonist, or echelantide, or intravenous C1 inhibitor. Now, uh, intubation or surgical um, airway intervention should be considered early in the process of upper, uh, should be assessed. These patients need to be assessed for, um, uh, you know, when they are undergoing these procedures, should be assessed for progressive upper and 
uh, airway edema because that can be fatal because a trauma, a trauma, as I said to you, can actually trigger attacks. Again, on-demand treatment should uh, should be given to all patients. Um, um, you know, uh, and, and these patients should be should have a sufficient medication for on-demand treatment all the time to treat attacks. Um, uh, you know, so they should have their treatment available to them uh, all the time. Now, the recommendation for pre-procedure um, or, or short-term, what we call short-term prophylaxis uh, of HIA patients, short-term prophylaxis before any medical or surgical or dental procedure um, as exposure to, to other angioedema attack inducing event is, is uh, recommended. So these patients need to have a short-term prophylaxis before, these, uh, before undergoing any intervention. Intravenous uh, plasma-derived CO inhibitor should be considered as the first line uh, in short-term prophylaxis. So patients undergoing uh, surgical procedure or any kind of dental procedure or any kind of procedure, there is an intervention there, we need to give them C1 inhibitor as um, you know, a prophylaxis um, before, this, the, before the procedure. Also, the prophylaxis should be considered by to exposure um, you know, uh, to, to um, specific angioedema inducing uh, situations, any situation that patients can, you know, uh, or potentially can develop uh, angioedema, this should be treated and um, uh, assessed all the time. Now, long term of prophylaxis, um, the goal of, of long term prophylaxis is to achieve total control of the disease and to make patients lead a normal life. So this is the aim. Now, patient, all patients should be evaluated for long-term prophylaxis at every visit. We need to assess the frequency of the system of symptoms, the severity, the frequency, etc., and to assess the disease burden as well. So uh, all patients need uh, to have regular assessment to assess whether they need long-term therapy or not. Now, the use of um, plasma-derived serum inhibitor is recommended first-line long-term prophylaxis. The problem with plasma-derived uh, C1 inhibitor is the lack of availability or short uh, you know, uh, supply, basically. And we had this problem um, some time ago where we, we weren't able to, to actually find or res resource or source um, the C1 inhibitor. So we're left in a situation where uh, you know, we, 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 we used um, basically treatment that um, uh, are not really very effective. Uh, so we cannot rely on plasma derived C1 inhibitor because of uh, various reasons. One of them is short supply. The other one is, it's a, uh, is a blood product. So you don't want to expose your patients to a blood uh, product unnecessarily. Now, there are two new therapies uh, that have come uh, about, and this is uh, actually, both of them are game changers. They've actually changed the face of treatment of HAE. One of them is alanidumab uh, and uh, the brittle stat. And um, again, they're now recommended as the um, first um, line um, long-term prophylaxis. So, um, and, and both of them, uh, both these medications are currently available um, in the UAE, uh, Lanadilumab, we have a number of patients on it, and currently we have one patient on the Tirulstat, which was recently introduced into the country. Now, um, long-term prophylaxis as well, androgen should, should only be used as a second line, uh, um, second line long-term prophylaxis. Androgen, we're talking about synthetic androgens here, like Danazol. Danazol has lots of issues, um, and, and really we don't like using it, but it is very effective, and it is the treatment of choice in the past in these patients. All patients who are using long-term prophylaxis routinely should be monitored for disease activity, impact, and control uh, to inform uh, and to optimize their treatment uh, dosage and, uh, and outcome. So again, as I said, these patients require uh, long-term monitoring and follow-up.
Now, in special situations like um, in, in, in children, for example, um, children um, should be tested, uh, particularly those of affected families. We need to make sure that they're um, have or haven't the disease because that is another burden on the patients. They need to know we need to intervene early and prevent delayed diagnosis. So children need to be uh, screened for HIA, particularly if there's a family history. The use of um, C1 inhibitor and icataband is recommended for treatment of attacks in children under the age of, 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 uh, of 12. Now, in pregnancy, we prefer or we recommend um, the C1 inhibitor um, because it is the safest and it's, it's really the treatment of choice uh, in pregnancy and lactation. Now, all patients should have action plans, really, and uh, all, you know uh, it should be comprehensive, integrated care. Uh, you should uh, be treated in a specialist uh, with a specialist expertise in managing HAE. So, these patients should be treated um, by really an immunologist or a dermatologist or infectious disease with experience uh, in treating patients with HAE. Um, Again, uh, all patients who are provided with on-demand treatment um, need to be uh, given, uh, you know, if possible, because this is another important issue, um, particularly when it comes to very high uh, cost medications, we need to reconsider this. I mean, this is a general statement about patients that can have high-tech medications at home, but I mean, we're reviewing this and it's really difficult to give a patient's an injection that costs 80,000 dirhams every two weeks to keep at home. I think this is really uh, unrealistic. I think high-tech drugs should be taken in hospital if they are. Now, over the next few minutes, uh, we're going to talk about the um, Taxiro, which actually a game changer uh, in the management of um, hereditary angioedema. This is the first uh, subcutaneous monoclonal antibody used in long-term prophylaxis for HAE. Now, um, it provides a targeted inhibition of um, plasma calcrine, uh, which is, uh, as I said earlier, a critical regulator of the bradycanine production. It reduces plasma calcrine activity to a physiological range similar to people without HAE. Now, this is really a pivotal study where it's, it's the, the HELP study, where uh, this is the largest uh, actually HAE study about the prevention uh, and for the um, for the longest period of time. Patients were given um, various doses of Taxiro, um, uh, 300 every two weeks, 300 milligrams every two weeks, uh, 300 milligrams every four weeks, and 150 milligrams um, every uh, four weeks. And the primary endpoint here is number of HIE attacks during treatment period, which was uh, 180 days, if you like. And again, here, if you look at this, uh, these uh, graphs, you'll see that the uh, really 87% um, of patients had a, a relative uh, reduction in number of HIE attacks um, on, the, on Taxiron for the treatment period. Not only that, but the um, moderate to severe attacks were, were also reduced significantly. Now, um, this is another important um, uh, finding where the uh, an increased number of patients had zero attacks. So about 44% had zero attacks, uh, the, um, which is really very, very important. And the sensitivity analysis uh, showed that the percentage of patients with zero attacks actually for, between day 7180 was 77%. So overall, many patients had zero attacks on Taxiro. Nearly at eight out of 10 patients had, had zero attacks uh, for the next uh, four months of treatment. I'll, I'll skip this slide for the sake of time. So the, this treatment is very safe. We have um, in real, uh, real world evidence, uh, we have about 12 patients on this treatment and there are, there are no side effects basically. And um, the side effects that are most frequent um, are you know, very common, which is injection site reaction, that's what you expect. 
uh, other um, uh, reactions or adverse effects are not really very common. So it is a very effective, efficacious, and safe therapy. Okay, so I'm going to finish off uh, by uh, sharing with you uh, patients which I think you'll be interested in because his story is very interesting. And um, that this patient is uh, Ali. We'll call him Ali. He's a 27 uh, uh, Emirati uh, pleasant young man. Um, between September 2015 to September 2016, he attended uh, our clinic, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, which is a tertiary center. Um, and he had 11 ED visits. Now, he had four to six gastroenterology clinic visits. He had abdominal CTs, scrotum ultrasound, and MRIs. He had two colonoscopies. And basically, there was no um, uh, you know, abnormality. There was no cause found for this guy's uh, uh, you know, problem. And when we got involved as immunologists in, in the manual of these patients, um, on detailed history, this guy had recurrent swelling for four years. These swellings affect um, his skin um, particularly, but his abdomen was the most uh, problematic symptom. Uh, and he had attended almost all Abu Dhabi hospitals between private um, and public. And he had had several colonoscopies, endoscopies, scans, laparoscopies, etc. He had, then this is the interesting bit. So his presentation was, was, was uh, so 27, so he's presented with this condition at the age of 23 years, and, and his family history was negative. Um, so, this is, uh, these are his um, investigations, and as you can see here, he had significantly reduced C4, significantly reduced C1 inhibitor function, C1 inhibitor a protein level, which was above the normal range. So um, other investigations are normal. So this guy has um, hereditary angioedema, type two, of course, because remember uh, in type one, you get uh, low C1 inhibitor level function and low C4. So everything is low here. You have C4 that is low and C4 fun uh, C inhibitor function is low, but C1 inhibitor level is, is uh, high. So that fits with type two hereditary angioedema. All his other blood tests are fine, no issues at all. So this is his um, uh, colonoscopy. And as you can see, there is diffuse uh, colonic mucosal swelling and there's no inflammation. Though this is really very nice, glossy, uh, uh, you know, colonic mucosa with no evidence of actual inflammatory uh, process there. So, uh, as I said, so this guy has a hereditary angioedema type two. We've treated him with transexamic acid, um, which we went up to uh, four to six grams daily, which is really a quite a high dose for two months, but there's no effect. We put him on Danazol, a synthetic androgen, 100 milligrams twice daily. It was somewhat effective. He still had minor swellings, but you know, better than he uh, has had before. Now, this guy de denied that he has this condition. He denied it completely. And he said, look, it can't be me, someone else. This is not me. So there was challenges with this guy. So one of them is, as I said, how to convince him that this is a chronic illness, life-threatening, serious problem that he needs treatment for. And he was poor compliant. This guy is a very active man, a policeman, and you know, he's a, you know, he's a, a biker, and you know, he enjoys life, etc. So he didn't care about the treatment, and that's why he was brought to uh, ED frequently, even when he was diagnosed and put on Danazol. But he didn't comply with his treatment and kept coming to ED. And of course, we need to think about treatment costs, etc. We actually managed to get uh, lanadilimab and, and, or, or uh, Taxiro, and we started him on this treatment um, every four weeks. However, we instructed him to, because of the cost, we've instructed him to come uh, or to contact the clinic uh, after two weeks. Now, the recommendation uh, for Taxiro is to use it 300 milligrams subcutaneously every two weeks. But because of the cost, we said, okay, let's try four weekly and then see what happens. So we have asked him to contact the clinic every two weeks. And if he didn't ring, we will 
um, I will ask one of the nurses to actually follow up with him. And he did extremely well. He did on this medication, did extremely uh, well. Uh, so he's done extremely well on four weekly treatment, has had had the bariatric surgery, and we needed to cover him with C1 inhibitor before the surgery. He remains swelling free for the treatment period, which extended. Now the treatment is extended to six weeks. He tried to come, uh, you know, uh, he said, look, doctor, I'm, I'm well. I don't want to come to the hospital. Let's try and get the treatment over six weeks. So I agreed. I said, look, if, if it comes back early, come. And of course, there are no issues with, with Taxiro at all. Now, if you're interested in this case study, it's already in the literature. You can, it's published, so you can, um, you know, Google my, you know, my, my name and it'll, it'll come up. And it's really very interesting uh, to go through it in the detail. Okay, so this is my uh, final slide. So in summary, HIE is an uncommon disease characterized by recurrent uh, episodes of swelling affecting different parts of the body. Uh, it's frequently underdiagnosed, most of the time misdiagnosed. So think of HAE, please, uh, in someone with recurrent unexplained abdominal pain. This is really the key here. Swelling attacks are uh, substantially impact patient quality of life. Uh, there are several treatments uh, available now, including on-demand uh, treatment for short-term prophylaxis and long-term prophylaxis. And now, the, as I said, lanolinumab, uh, is really a game changer for these patients, which provides a rapid, sustained prevention of HA attacks. And of course, these patients need a specialist care and a specialist, uh, um, you know, a referral to a specialist is really, really uh, high, uh, and highly recommended. I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions if there is time.